So my advisor said, Candace, come talk to me. Uh, we need to figure this out because you might sell out of PA school in your first class. Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Hello, how are you Happy guys? Happy Monday. Welcome to East Shadowing. I'm Adeline, as you all may know. And today I have Candace tuning in. Candace is our guest PA. Hi, Candace. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on, Candace. Hi, everybody. So, Candace is a PA that I actually met in New York. We worked together, and um, we totally hit it off. And uh, I love her story and her path to becoming a PA and everything she stands for and does and her work ethic. So I wanted to bring her on to um, not only tell us a little bit about New York that I probably haven't told you guys, but to talk about her path to becoming a PA and her journey and how she found out about the career and what she did to get to um, to get into PA school and get to where she is now. So Candace has been a PA for eight years, right, Candace? Yes, eight years. <laughs> right. So, Candace, can you tell us about your journey to becoming a PA? When did you first hear about the PA career and what made you decide on PA? So, I actually have wanted to be a PA since I was seven years old. I, um, I used to go to my pediatrician office and there was only a PA that I saw every single time. And so, the actual pediatrician. And so I really fell in love with her. Her name was Kim Maris. I don't know if she's out there somewhere, but she was my role model. And I really loved um, the way she interacted with me, my family. And, you know, I was kind of like, how do I become you when I grow up? And so it wasn't like I um, wanted to do be a doctor first. I kind of like found a PA and was like, OK, that is what I want to do because she is awesome. Um. So what I did was I de I basically dedicated my life to becoming a PA after that. Um, well, mainly I didn't focus on it until high school, but I went in and I said, you know what? I don't have a backup plan. Like, I am going to be a PA. There's just no option for me. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So what did you do like from since you knew since age seven when she told me this I couldn't believe it I'm like really I think because I didn't think because I mean the PA career is so new so a lot of people don't know about it until um you know they get to either high school or college so being that you found out so early how did you prepare yourself so first of all I just kind of um in high school, I did my shadowing. I actually got fortunate enough to have a family friend um, do me a favor and let me shadow. She was an orthopedic spine PA. Um, so I did shadowing with her as, as often as I could. Started in high school, continued through college. Um, I didn't have like a ton of hours. Um, they just want to see that you have at least some shadowing experience just so that you know um, what it is what it's like to be a PA. And so I think I only got maybe 60 to 100 total hours and they still were totally fine with that. You also have to think about your volunteer work. Um, you know, community service is a big one. And then um, my biggest thing that I wish I would have known when I was applying was when you do your CASPA, don't wait till the deadline to submit your your application because there is a deadline yes but it's first come first serve basis so yeah. it let's say let's say you um you have everything in line you have your letter of recommendations you have everything set up but you're just missing one little thing so you wait until the deadline to submit your caspa well there's about however many other um people out there who submit like have it all ready before the deadline even opens and so when it opens, they immediately submit it. And then that's a higher likely um, for you to be able to get um, get in easier is to have everything prepared, know what, you know, know what schools you want to apply to. My other strategy was to apply to more than one school, um, because I from what I was told, um, it, if you're applying to more than one school, it shows how you're dedicated. 
Um, it shows that you're really interested that if, if one school doesn't want you, then you can get in another, it, it, you have other options. They want to know right. you have other options too. Um, so then, you know, I spent my whole, um, my whole college life um, doing things that could help benefit me to becoming a PA. So my major was a big one. So biology is what everyone thinks that they want or thinks that that's what PA school is looking for is a biology degree. Well, that's not true. I actually did a general studies, um, a general studies um, degree. And that's where you basically can pick three upper upper level um, types of fields that you can study on your own. It doesn't have to be related to um It doesn't have to be related to PA school at all, but one of them obviously was going to be biology because you have so many prereqs and so many mandatory classes that you need in biology. But the good news is I also picked some, um, I guess you could say easier um, uh, studies. So I did psychology and I did development and family studies. Um, Development and family studies is a great um, platform because you learn about the the way children um, interact with families, and especially if you want to do family medicine, you get to see how these children develop over time, and you kind of learn that before you get into PA school. Another one is the psychology. You can you see psychiatry type patients in any field that you do. You can see it in children, you can see it in adults, you can see it in family medicine, you see it in the ER. Um, so it kind of made me feel and look in their eyes more well-rounded versus just trying to get my um, my studies in biology it showed that I had a more broad um, education and so it didn't take away the fact that I did um, biology you know what I mean like I still did all the mandatory classes but it actually helped me get out of some of the very hard classes for a biology major that you actually don't need as a PA. Right, right. Same here. I was not a biology degree as well, or science degree. I was sociology. So a lot of my classes were, you know, they were on the easier end, you know, and then I just took the prereqs, did what I got to do. So you really don't at all have to be a biology major. So if you found out about the PA career really late in your college um, education, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm a dance major. It's okay. It's it's perfectly fine. That's actually amazing that you are a dance major or an engineering major or whatever it is that you are that are you that you decide to get a degree in as long as you get those prereqs. Yes, the prereqs are the only thing, and um, you can make your education as diverse as you want. And they want diversity. They want to see that you aren't like every single person that's applying. They want to see some kind of uh, what makes you stand out? You know, what makes exactly. you, what makes you different? How, what is that school looking for as far as diversity? So, right, um, right. yeah, given that, and then getting your CASPA in on time are probably the biggest things. And it also boosts your GPA. You know how hard biology classes can be. You can sometimes make a lower grade there and make straight A's and everything else. And it will help your GPA. Not only right. are you more well-rounded, your GPA can get higher. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I forgot to mention that Candice is from Dallas, Texas. Candice, where did you go to school undergrad and, and PA school? So I went to the University of North Texas, UNT. It's uh, just north of DFW. And then I went to Texas Tech Health um, Sciences Center in Lubbock. Um, for my PA program. It was a more rural, underserved um, type of school. So it's actually pretty cool because when when you go to a really big, well-known school in a big city, uh, you may not get as much hands-on experience as you would going to a lower, like, underserved area. The reason is there's um, more opportunity for you to to do things um, on your own. If you're in a huge city, um, you, you may be with residents and other PA programs and other, you know, people that are going to be fighting for that time. So right. for me, I loved doing my rural type of um, 
uh, education. I even got to deliver babies via C-section. I delivered twins on my own with the help of the surgeon, of course, the OB-GYN. Um, but he let me cut into it and literally did the whole thing. It was pretty amazing. Um, just awesome. to see those those babies in the water sac and the amniotic sac and able to just kind of pull that pull their pull them out and just see wow that is like the miracle of life it's it was just very cool wow wow awesome yeah thank you so much for that <laughs> so, yeah um, let's see there's already some questions um somebody had I saw a first question let me see. Uh, it, it's about the prereqs and were you able to take all your prereqs in undergrad or did you have to take some post back? No, I actually, um, uh, most schools, most universities are very good at, um, at financial or not financial, um, advisors. Okay. So the best thing that you can do when you very, when you start college is go to the, um, financial, or the, I'm sorry, go to the, the the planning offices the registrar and tell them hey i want to be pre-pa they will give you a list of exactly um what classes you need what courses you need it'll tell you how to like the upper level biology classes you'll need like a pre prereqs to those classes such as you know general biology one and then you'll go up to genetics and then you know and so on and it gives you the list exactly as what they want so you can um, put your degree in anything. Just follow the recommendations that the registrar gives you, um, so that you can you can you know exactly what classes you need and what you don't need. And I also took a couple of um, my basic core classes at a community college during the summer, and they accepted that too. Um, I didn't do any of my really like like upper level studies I'm sorry? at. A, at I didn't do any of my upper level studies in the community college, but some of the classes you can, and it saves you money. Right, right. And someone said it's hard to take prereqs because schools have so many different requirements. Typically, they'll have the same science um, requirements. For the most part, a lot of schools want you to have gen um, general chemistry one and two, may or may not ask for organic chemistry. We'll definitely ask for microbio and statistics and um, biology, at least one of biology. Typically, they'll have the same um, general uh, science classes. They may say, some schools may say genetics, some schools may say biochemistry or orgo two, but it'll be just be a few schools that are a little different. But for the most part, like make sure you take at least chemistry one and two, biology, microbiology, statistics, and um, organic chemistry. And also um, look into what schools you want to go to. Pick right. five, five or six schools that you really are interested in and go online to their, um, their prerequisite page on their, on their website. It will tell you, even the, the registrar had all that information for each school. Like for, let's say for one school, I had to do one extra class. It's really that simple. It's it's usually a difference between one class you have to take versus one class you don't have to take. So really just go online to research your schools, figure out where you think you want to go. For me, I applied to all the schools in Texas because I'm from Texas and, and I, and I love the state. So, um, you know, I just, uh, looked on there and saw, okay, well, Texas Tech's deadline was actually in December versus all the other schools in Texas deadline was in October. So there is differences, but they're only my minor differences. And mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to figure out you know, I would get everything you possibly can to to where to at least five different schools, just awesome. so you have options. Yes, I definitely agree. Definitely agree. So start figuring figuring out your schools and see what they require and do those classes. For the most part, it'll be very similar classes. And if you're not sure if what you took will count as credit, just contact the school. It's yeah, it doesn't hurt. Just call, email or call the school up and you know confirm with them. Or you can find out on their website as well. So we're going to move on to PA school now. So Candice, tell us about how PA school was for you. 
and what some advice you would give everyone that, you know, once they get into paid school, some of the do's and don'ts. Um, okay, so PA school is not easy. I'm just going to start with that. PA school is very rigorous. It is two years of just jam-packed information. You are learning every, almost basically everything a doctor learns. You're doing your didactic in first year. One year, you're going to learn all four years of medical school into that one first year. Um, so it is a full-time job. Basically, you have to go to classes every single day. You have to go eight to five, Monday through Friday. You'll go over about anywhere from 100 to 400 PowerPoint slides in one day. Um, and then you may have a test over it the next day. So you go, you go to class all day, you type your notes, you learn, you study. And then when you get home, you have to study. And the biggest thing for me was that, um, it, it's nothing like your undergrad. It's nothing like call or high school. You really, really have to jump in and just start working as hard as possible because, um, when I first started, they actually had us do uh, pharmacology as one of our first classes. It's one of the hardest classes in PA school. And so, you know, I had this uh, teacher uh, advisor and, you know, I wasn't and to be honest, I wasn't taking PA school as seriously as you really have to. So for my first um, class, my pharmacology class, I we would have quizzes to test us and I was making kind of, you know, a little bit lower grades. So my advisor said, Candace, come talk to me. Uh, we need to figure this out because you might fail out of PA school in your first class. And I, it was just such a shock, such a wake up call. I was like, oh, my goodness, I worked my whole life for this. Why am I not doing what I need to do? So it is a major shock. It is hard. It is it's rigorous, but it is 100 percent worth it once you get done. So um, you just got to keep up with everything. Just try to um, balance your, balance your life, balance your friends. It's hard to, um, it's really hard to keep up. Um, but if you really focus, get your mind in there, say, you know, this is your dream. This is your goal. This is something you've been working for. You got the opportunity to be one of those lucky people who made it into PA school. Cause it is very competitive. Um, you know, you got to work for it. So that's just something that is inevitable. Right, right. That was a great story because um, a lot of people struggle when they first get into PA school because they kind of study the way that they've been studying undergrad where they're kind of just learning to get by and just learning to get an A or just just to pass. I mean, well, just to, you know, get an A and pass that test. But in PA school, it's completely different because you're no longer learning, you know, just to pass the test, but you're learning to retain information and to actually treat people and take care of people in real life. And that'll be your license in the future. So you have to really take it serious. And, um, you know, if, if that means sacrificing where you can't go out, you know, every weekend or where you have to stay up and study until you understand something, that's what you got to do. You have to learn to understand. It's no longer to just kind of, oh, I got to get a C or got to get a, yeah, it is. It's not about getting an A in PA school. But it's most important thing is to learn, to actually learn, <laughs> to learn so you can know what you're doing, to learn, to understand and say, oh, OK, I may not understand this 100 percent, but I have a good idea of what's going on. And, and the best um, thing. Oh, sorry. The, oh, no. the best thing you can do is find friends, get a study group. Even if you don't study together and you're just sitting at a table, like studying on your own, it feels so much better than being alone, isolated at your house. Make study groups. You don't have to interact with these people um, unless it benefits your studying. Um, that's what I did. It really made things a lot more um, valuable and easier was just to be around your your colleagues who are in the same situation as you who are doing you know just this vigorous lifestyle uh it's always good to be be with a, a little bit of some some kind of friends study study together independently study together you know 
Right, right, right. And um, a few people are asking whether PS schools pass fail or whether you have to maintain an average. Um, as far as I know, um, I haven't heard of schools becoming pass fail. I know a lot of medical schools are just pass fail, which I think is actually a great idea because it's not about the grades. It's about, you know, like I said, um, that making sure that you're um, understanding what you learn. But um, as far as I know, schools are um, graded. So you have to have at least a C um, a C average, I believe it is. What is it? A seventy or seventy-five? Yeah, um, our, but our I have heard of to some... stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have heard some schools wanting to transition to just pass fail, so or but, new programs too. But yeah, like let's say um, you have a like one class will have quizzes. Let's say you make below a seventy-five on one of your quizzes. It's your average. Um, testing score. So you can make below a C on some things, but really you have to, like your average has to be 75 or higher right. for most schools. And, um, or you will fail out. And if you do fail out, you can't go back. They right. don't let you go back. Right, right, right. So keep on top of your studies. Stay on top of that. Okay. Very so, important. So now we're really going to quickly talk about um, what did you do after you graduated PA school? How soon did you get a job and what was your first job? Um, okay. So let's start by what did I want to do when <laughs> I, before I got into PA school? So my dream job was actually to follow in the footsteps of that PA, Miss Maris. Um and do pediatric clinic. Well, when you're in PA school, you get to do um, uh, like 12 different fields of medicine, I think 10 or 12, and you get to spend six week weeks in each field. So the good thing is you get to really get some hands-on experience in all these different fields, let's say surgery, psychiatry, OB-GYN, family medicine, you know, and so on. You get to spend six weeks in each field. So you really learn what you like and what you dislike. And so when I first started PA school, I said, I'm going to do pediatric clinic. Well, let me tell you this. When I was doing pediatric clinic, that's just not for me. It is. Um, it's just not for me. It was a uh, too. I'm a very fast paced busybody. So I realized very quickly that I wanted to do ER um, or urgent care, or family medicine. So my first job, uh, it's very hard when you for, as a new grad to get a get the perfect job that you want. Right. Um, so you kind of have to take what what you can get at that point, because you just need the experience. I did family medicine. And it was a and I love family medicine for the fact that, you know, you have continuity of care, you see your patients, um, you know, every three or four months, and you get to know them really well. And, um, you know, who this person is and continue to see them. Um, but you know, for me, I, I just would go over labs and then repeat, repeat. So, um, I wasn't one of those people who really likes clinic. Um, I liked, you know, some action and some, um, I love doing procedures like lacerations and, um, you know, those type of things that you get to do in the ER. Um, and so I went from family medicine, I got my year experience and then I, it was so much easier for me to find a job. I got into urgent care after that, that kind of paved my way into doing, learning how to do all the procedures. It's good to start off fresh out of PA school with a broad or general, um, field just so you can get your bearings down because although you do study and you do your clinicals you still don't know what you're doing when you get out <laughs> so you really learn on the job as to what exactly you need to do and um you know urgent care family medicine those really kind of helped me um kind of get the basics of all types of medicine um and then when i got into the er it's it was i was pretty prepared for it um, it's not easy. It's not easy. But if you have that type of mentality where you, you love to see uh, something different every day, you want to do procedures, you want to, uh, you don't want to uh, be in a clinic setting, like that's a perfect um, thing for you. And so that's what me and uh, Rodalyn are doing now in New York is ER. We're really enjoying it. Um, it's, it's nice to be in a different setting 
state completely just to see how, you know, they do things differently here. So, so I did a mix of family medicine, urgent care and emergency medicine. Right. Awesome. And ER is your favorite. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so awesome. We're going to move on to the case study soon in about like five to 10 minutes. But um, can you tell us a little bit about the ER? Um, you know, what you like, dislike about it, a typical day in the ER and, um, you know, how your time has been in New York thus far? Um, you know, like you said, being in another state is, you know, is different com compared to Texas. It's a different pa patient population. So tell us a little bit about New York. I haven't talked too much about, you know, <laughs> where I work in New York. So you can share some of that if you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I can't go into too many details about exactly what goes down. But right. I can tell you that um, every emergency medicine is emergency medicine. It's going to be pretty straightforward from all from all aspects as far as how you're going to treat the patients. Um, we see a lot of, um, uh, so some PAs, when I started, I ended up doing like fast track for the, for the ER, which is basically like an urgent care part of the ER where you kind of see broken bones and, and colds and stuff. Uh, but some ERs actually implicate the PAs in, everything, which is what I like. Um, so I would, you know, you go in, you pick up a patient, um, you, you see them, let's say I'm going to have a patient with chest pain, I pick up the patient, um, I ordered, I, I evaluate the patient, I ask them questions about their history, family history, you know, do they smoke? What, what is the pain like? What, what does it radiate, you know, going all into a lot of details there. And then so you work them up for the emergency situation. Every field of medicine is different. So if you're in family medicine, you're not going to be diagnosing the person with a heart attack. You're not going to be f figuring that out. In family medicine, if someone comes in with chest pain, you refer to the ER. The ER is uh, the highest level of care. So you end up doing a lot more workup, a lot more testing than you would in any other field. Um, because you're the since you're the highest level, you're going to be the one that needs to find out exactly if there's an emergency going on or not. Is the patient safe to go home or does this patient need to be monitored and admitted? Do they need, do they have any um, signs? If they do have a heart attack, they need to go straight to the cath lab. Um, you know, there's just things that you have to be hyper aware of when you're doing emergency medicine. You can't just um, say, okay, let me refer this out and someone else take care of it. You are it. So you really have to um, be really good with documentation. We do charting, um, you know, and then so I'll, so after I get the good full history, I kind of decide like, is this chest pain more like a muscle pain? Did they have an injury? Or then um, is this a heart attack pain? So I'll just, um, I'll go ahead and, um, just figure that type of thing out. And then you order your labs. And then if they're, if all the labs and EKG and everything is good and you feel that they are safe to go home, then you send them home. But it's a really, it's a really cool thing to be that top level of care um, to be able to determine, Hey, this patient is safe. This patient is unsafe. Um, and so then after you get done, you can either present your case to your attending physician um, as soon as you pick it up, if you don't feel comfortable, let's say it's your first year and you're just now starting ER, um, you present your case to um, your physician and say you order your labs, you have them check up, make sure you've ordered everything correctly. Um, and then once you get more experienced, you're going to um, probably present your diagnosis to the physician. You're going to say, OK. So this patient came in with this, and now I did this entire work up here. This is what I found. This is the diagnosis. I think they need to go home, or I think they need to be admitted. So and that's kind of how it works. Um, the doctor is always on your side. You always have someone to look, look for in case you have a question. Um, so it, it's always a good thing because um, if you're doing some kind of urgent care where you're the sole provider, um, and you're fresh out of school, it may be a more difficult to figure out what you're doing. 
Um, so I think it's always good to work in a broad, um, broad spectrum type of environment, as well as, um, work, having a place that's going to have someone there at all times to guide you as to how to do things. After you get a couple of years of experience, like you won't need that. You can be an independent pro- um, provider. I worked at the urgent care for three years and I didn't have the doctor there with me the entire time. So, um, what it's all it's all based on your clinical experience and your um your your com- how comfortable you are um seeing patients thank you thank you so much and i definitely agree with that uh, when you're just starting off um i mean unless you you say oh i want to do surgery i always want to do surgery i love surgery Yes, of course, do surgery. But if you want to do ER, like she said, start off in a broad environment like family medicine, um, where you'll be able to see a lot of different things and get used to that. And, you you know, if you don't practice it or don't see it, you lose it. So if you're a new um, a new grad and you want to see everything or retain information learned in PA school, um, you know, definitely do some family medicine or some a, a very broad uh, specialty or I mean, just primary care. Okay. And, so, and and if you do want to specialize in something right off the bat, um, most specialties do like having new grads because they can mold you into what they want you to do. Um, some specialties don't want you to have too much experience because then you're already doing things your own way. And most of these specialties really like to be able to mold you to do things exactly the way they would like for it to be done. So right, it's right. It, you can go both ways. If you're 100 dead set on surgery and you know you don't want to do anything else, then you probably should. You could just go straight on to that. But, you know, it, you, the, the, the beautiful thing about PA is that you can switch specialties anytime you want. Um, you can do like I said, you can go to inpatient psychiatry to surgery because you actually get trained right. in every field of medicine. You get right, trained right. in all of it. Awesome. So, OK, we have a really we have a good question from Chelsea. She said, for Candace, do you ever have to deal with patients who would rather not see you because you aren't MD? What do you tell those patients? How do you deal with difficult patients to ease their minds? I love that question because it does happen all the time. It's not very, very frequent, but um, it, it, it also depends on what setting you're in. So when I first started in family medicine, to believe it or not, I was 23 years old. I graduated fresh out of school. I went straight to PA school and was, you know, a 23 year old PA. And so there was um, this family medicine clinic was a geriatric clinic, and um, a lot of them were just so used to seeing a doctor. So when they saw my fresh young young face. Um, they did have questions. They didn't know. They didn't know if they could trust me. They didn't know how that was going to go because, you know, I looked young. I was young. And, you know, I um, but you um, as a PA, you actually get so much training on how to battle this. So basically, all I say is, OK, I know you uh, I know you want to see an MD, but I can guarantee you that um I can help you with anything that you need. Um, and the doctor's right here. If you um, have any questions or if you aren't comfortable, can we just see how this goes? And um, I can assure you that you're going to get the top level of care, regardless of if you see me or the doctor. Um, give me that chance and, you know, just kind of right. see how we do. And then some people will say, most people, when you say, hey, Let's just see how it goes. They're they're very open and they say, oh, okay." Uh, especially if you kind of explain like you learn everything the doctor learns in in a year. It's just an accelerated program. Um, But you do have that experience and knowledge under your belt. They pretty much will trust you. Um, And uh, so you just got to reassure them. And then there's also some who will continue to say, no, I don't want to see I don't want to see you. I want to see the doctor. And in in that case, you can just get the doctor involved. Um, It's very rare that I have to get the doctor involved when that happens. Uh, Once I kind of go through with them, because a lot of people don't know what a PA is. They don't know. 
So if you educate them a little bit and you have this compassion, say, I hear what you, I hear you. I, I know that you're concerned, but I can guarantee you you're under the best care and I'm going to do a great job with you as best I can. And so after about uh, three or four months, I would see these patients. They'd come back and they would want to see me over the doctor the next time. And the doctor would be like, why are my patients going on Candace's schedule? It's like, because you have this, you build connections with people. You have to be a people person. You have to be able to talk to people and make them feel comfortable. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much for that. And sometimes the doctors don't even want to be bothered. Like they'll, they like, we will tolerate a lot more than the doctors. Trust me. Sometimes they're like, if you're taught, like, you know, being difficult, they're just like, okay, whatever. But we'll sit there and like, you know, try to work with you and talk to you and everything. But some doctors, uh -uh, they they don't have time for that. (laughs) Yeah. And that's, that's a big thing with PA uh, versus doctors. A lot of people say, and this is just feedback from patients, like, Oh, I love seeing the PA. I love seeing the PA because they like to talk to you. They like to get to know you. They like to sit down and really thoroughly listen to you. And, you know, doctors do the same, but it's just something about PAs. They're just so much, so personable. You just, it's kind of like when you become a PA, you just, you just know you have that compassion for people. Right, 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 right. Thank you so much, Candice, for that. So, guys, we're going to move on to the case study next. We got so so hey so hail. Hi, can so hail. Yeah. yeah, I can so hail. Hi. 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 Um, thank you so much for coming on. No problem. Are you are you pre PA? Yes, I'm a sophomore. Uh, I go to Hunter College, and I'm from Queens, New York. Oh, I'm in Queens oh. right now. Nice. <laughs> nice. I'm in Ridgewood. That's awesome. Nice. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Sohail. So, Candice, let's um, start the case study. Okay, are you ready? Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> okay, okay. So, you've got a 23-year-old female. She's got a past medical history of diabetes, type 1. Uh, she prevent, presents to the emergency department for a four-hour history of right lower quadrant abdominal pain. She says the pain started in around the navel, the periumbilical area, and then radiated to the right lower quadrant, which is where it now is staying. She says the pain is sharp and, and it came on suddenly. She denies any fever, body aches, nausea, vomiting. She doesn't have any flank pain, burning with urination, tarry, black or tarry stools, no burning with, uh, no vaginal discharge. Patient takes insulin on a daily basis, but no other medication. Um, there's no relevant past family or surgical history. Uh, patient does not drink, smoke, or do any recreational drugs. So her vitals are very stable and normal. We've got a normal temp of 98.4. Respirations are 16. Her oxygen saturation is 98%. Her heart rate 76 and her blood pressure is 126 over 72. Um, okay. So we do the physical exam. Um, the, let's say she's well appearing. She doesn't appear toxic, no distress. Her lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. Her heart is regular rate and rhythm. There's no murmurs. I get to her abdomen and there's tenderness over, uh, with palpation to the right lower quadrant over something called McBurney's point. Um, I do a couple of testing on her. Um, she's got a positive heel strike sign, positive SOAPS obturator. And um, I check her back. There's no back pain over the kidneys, the CVA, costover tubular angle tenderness. Um, didn't exam her, um, didn't do a pelvic exam, and she's alert and oriented times three. So let's first ask, what is located, if you know, in the right lower quadrant? What are some things that are located there? So of your right. abdomen. So you have your um, small intestines, large intestines, and you know, saying right lower quadrant right away. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, uh, appendicitis, but you know, it's not always the case, but that's the first place my mind is going. Uh huh. So you also have to think this is a female, right? Yeah. So what else is in the right lower side on a female? Um, your ovaries and fallopian tubes. 
You got it. Yes. And so, so you, so yes, we've got the ovaries, appendix, part of the colon. You also have your ureter that from the kidney that goes down into the bladder and then you got the fallopian tube. All right. So, um, you said appendicitis is one of the possible diagnoses. What else could it be? It could be, how old did you say she was? She's 23. Okay. So, um, it might, she may be pregnant. Like that's something we'll have to ask her. Um, it might be an ectopic pregnancy. Um, Good. Uh, can't, yeah, that's, that's all my, that's my differentials right now. Okay. Yeah. That's really good. That's a great one. Um, yeah, she could be pregnant. She could have an ectopic pregnancy. That's a pregnancy inside the tube. Um, her ovaries, she could have ovarian torsion. That's where the twisting of the ovaries, she could have, let's say, um, she doesn't have any vaginal discharge, but she could have pelvic inflammatory disease where it's, um, caused by an STD, appendicitis, um, she could have maybe a urinary tract infection, the bladder's right there. Um, and then maybe a, a colon, like inflammatory bowel disease or a, a kidney stone. Yeah. Um, so those are all some things. Okay, what kind of imaging might be needed? Uh, what, what kind of imaging can we do to kind of rule this stuff out? I think we should definitely start with an x-ray. Um, you know, I don't know the imaging too well, but... Uh, maybe a CT or MRI scan. I'm not really sure of the difference, so you can go into that. You're doing you're doing really good. Yes, yes. We would do a CT scan for the appendix and an ultrasound to look at the ovaries. Huh. Um, and the and the 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 um, an X-ray. You could do a KUB, a, a kidney, ureter, and bladder X-ray. It's a one view, basically, where um, you can possibly see a kidney stone. But the, the more diagnostic tool is a CAT scan um, for kidneys and appendix and colon. The ultrasound is for the ovaries and tubes and everything. Okay, do you know um, what labs might be needed? Just, a, um, just name like two labs you could do. Maybe blood tests and urine, urine tests maybe? Yes, yeah. So uh, the blood test could be uh, a CBC. CBC would show um, elevated white blood cell count to indicate an infection. Um, another test in the blood is a comprehensive metabolic panel that would test your kidney function, liver function, glucose, and the electrolytes. So let's say you do think like maybe this is a kidney stone. You might see some um, some kidney um, acute kidney injury, or in the urine you may see some blood or protein or or leukocytes. Okay, so the results are in. The CT shows the appendix is dilated at eight millimeters. There's a wall thickening of three millimeters, and there's mesenteric fat stranding around the appendix. So what is the diagnosis? Is it appendicitis? Yes, yes. And what is the treatment for appendicitis? Do you know? Um, do we go in the operating room? I'm not sure. Yes, you are very, you are awesome. You did, uh, you got almost everything right. So yes, it's an emergency appendectomy in the OR. And that's all I've got from you. Awesome. You did really good. Thank you. You're already in PA school, aren't you? <laughs> no. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. Good job, so hell. Thank that was you. awesome. Listen, I told you, like, the, they know so much. They're so smart because I did not know, like, everything that, like, somebody said McBurney's point in the comments. I'm like, how do you know that already? Because <laughs> yeah. I sure did not know that um, pre PA. I know. I see. I didn't know exactly how knowledgeable you guys are. And it's it's really great to see that even without being in PA school, that you have some general knowledge of this stuff, because this is what you're going to be doing. This is how you're going to be seeing patients. This is how it's going to look. You're going to see the vitals. You're going to see the you're going to say, oh, this patient is a female. So I got to think about this stuff. You know, it's very you got to think about everything in the history that was given to you. Right, right, exactly. Good job, guys. Awesome, awesome job. Um, let's see. So, so Hale, what, um, how are you getting your your um your pre health hours, your patient care hours? Well, um, 
once I figured out that PA, the PA field was uh, something I wanted to pursue, I uh, started looking into, you know, clinical hours and how I can obtain those hours. Um, so I recently completed uh, EMT class and I'll be writing my certification exam soon. So hopefully I pass that and then I can begin, you know, um, begin getting those hours up. That's a great thing to do. That would be a really great because you're going to learn a lot as, as doing EMT stuff. Yeah. Um, it'll really prepare you for um, PA school. It'll, I'm telling you, that's a really good one. Another good one is being a scribe at uh, the ER. Um, the scribes are the people who document everything for the doctor um, in the chart. So the doctor will just say, hey, put in the chart, this patient has right lower quadrant, abdominal pain, tenderness here. So really the scribe gets to see the history, they get to see the physical, they get to see the results and the labs and the treatment. So it's pretty good. Uh, that's a pretty good experience if you're just trying to get some hours of learning. Uh, you learn so much from that. I've, I know some scribes who know how to uh, read CAT scans because they've done it for so long and the doctors, they're always with the doctors and the doctors are always teaching them stuff. Yes, yes. EMT is great. I think like EMT, being a scribe, patient care tech, like those are all awesome ways to get experience. And you're going to get so good at um, drawing blood, putting in IVs, like you're going to be great. Good job and good luck. I did a pharmacy technician too before I got into PA school. So it was really good because it taught me the, the names of drugs. That's the hardest thing is to pronounce these names of the drugs and know exactly what they're for. So that was a good thing for me. Although pharmacology was still very hard. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys. So, I really thank appreciate Thank you so much, Sohail, for coming on. No problem. Thank you. And I said, do you have any questions for us? Questions? What would you say is... No, he doesn't. <laughs> I, I, I do have one question I can think of now. Um, what do you... What, what did you use as motivation, like, when times got really tough in PA school for you to continue pushing forward? Because it's a, it's a like, I, from what I hear, it's a very um, rough journey. And, you know, there's so much you have to do. So what was your, for each of you, what was your motivating factor? Mine was making friends and doing those study groups with friends. They keep you sane because if you're sitting at home by yourself studying every day, single day for hours upon end, you go stir crazy. And so the best thing for me was like, oh my gosh, I think I'm going to lose my mind here. So I would go and meet up with my friend Katie. Um, we, we bought bicycles and we'd go ride bikes for like 30 minutes just to get, you know, your mind off of studying and, and get, you know, some fresh air. Uh, and then we would go back and we'd sit down and we'd study separately, but, uh, but still having a company of other people just helps so much. So for me, uh, as far as just kind of motivating me to push forward to keep going, um, I had a wall that I put up. I forgot the quote that was on the wall, but I like, I mean, it was a board, like a little motivation board. And I would just look at it every day and kind of like reflect on always reflect on, you know, where I was versus where I want to be um, versus where I am. Well, where I was versus where I am now, versus where I want to be. So I would just always look at it. And then of course I had um, family that like was just very supportive and I would cry too. And they would, you know, tell me to keep going and push me forward, especially my parents. So, um, yeah, I would just always look at that wall, man. Like if, if you guys have to like get sticky, sticky pads, like stick sticky notes and write them, like write it, um, put post sticky notes all over the wall, your bathroom mirror, like, if you have to do that, um, post little words of affirmation and look at look at it every single day. Do that, like whatever you feel like is gonna push you and motivate you. Do that, whether it's you know doing the sticky notes, speaking to family, go, going out with friends. Yeah, so that was what helped me. <laughs> And also just um, enjoy it because there is a lot of fun things about PA school too. Um, it's not all 
horrible and scary and rough. It is very fun too. You get to, you know, you have your physical exam labs, you like where you get to learn how to intubate on mannequins and you get to do splinting, casting, and, you know, you do a whole man exam with your friend and, you know, it's, it's got a lot of other things than just sitting on a, in a chair from eight to five and also just having your end goal in mind. Like, you made it. There's 60 seats in this school. They only accept, they only accept uh, once per year, 60 students. You made it there. And the fact that you can make it there, it would just be devastating to, to fill out. You know, you have this mindset like, oh my gosh, I, I actually am here. I'm doing it. I'm fulfilling my dream. And that in itself is just so rewarding when you're, when you're studying too. Exactly, exactly. So, um, I mean, as hard as it is, just, you know, soak it all in, enjoy the moment, even when you're studying, make the best of it. And you got this, all of you. Awesome, guys. Thanks for the advice. Thank you Thank so you. much, Sohail. Good luck. Thank you. All righty. Okay, so, um, so guys, it's almost over. Thank you so much for coming on, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Candace, for taking my students and answering their questions. Thank yes. you. Um, what are some parting words? I know you are. You said a lot of motivating things and um, words, and they're grateful for that. They said you gave some really good advice in the comments section. So what mm. are some just takeaways that um, you want to tell the students? Um, okay, some takeaways that I would have liked to have had when I was applying for PA school, particularly, was what are these people looking for? So um, they're looking for someone who is well rounded, that's got their hours, but they also are looking for someone who um, kind of stands out, you got to make your personal statement um, stand out from everyone else's. And um, a way to do that is to just kind of like for me, mine was like, I wanted to be a PA since I was seven. Um, also getting your CASPA in early is another thing. Um, because again, it's first come first serve. And um, getting the hardest thing that was that really um, kept me from submitting mine on time was um, the letter of recommendation. I got one from my biology instructor, um, the pharmacist I worked for, and also um, uh, pharmacist, biology, and the PA. So the PA took the longest to write my letter of recommendation. So make sure that's the first thing you ask people because it does take time to sit down and write that letter of recommendation. Just make sure you have everything done before the CASPA even opens. It'll tell you everything that you need um, and just get that stuff submitted because um, like I said, I got mine submitted right at the deadline and I, and I ended up on the waiting list. Um, but don't be discouraged if you're on the waiting list. Um, people will accept multiple offers to multiple schools. And by the end of it, um, they will pick one school. And so those people that are reserving spots at the schools that you're, you're wanting, those will come open up. I don't think anyone that was on the waiting list did not get in. So that's another thing that don't be worried about that. If you get an interview, you're good. Just be yourself. Oh, and one more thing, you exactly. may not, you may not get in on the first try. I got super lucky and I'm very thankful for that. But um, I had a lot of friends. It took one, maybe two other tries to get in. Um, so just if don't get discouraged, if you don't get in the first time, keep going. This is your dream. And also make it a make it a very obvious that this is your dream when you're applying. You don't want to be like, oh, this is my second choice to med school. This is, oh, I didn't, I, I decided I didn't want to be nursing. I couldn't get it in nursing school. So I'm just applying for this. Make sure it's something that they can, because they will be able to see if you've applied anywhere else. And so if you do apply somewhere else, just tell like, and they ask you about it in an interview, you want to be able to answer them why you decided to be a PA, because they're really, really looking for someone who 
has PA as like their number one. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. So um, they're asking for your contact information. Is there any way that they can reach you if they need some advice or have more questions to ask? Yeah, you can um, email me uh, at my Candace Solk at Yahoo. That's my, uh, Rodalyn can give you the spelling of that. And then also I have a LinkedIn profile. Um, The LinkedIn profile, you can send me messages, add me, whatever you need to do. I do a lot of LinkedIn. I I have met a couple of students that have shadowed me um, just by connecting through LinkedIn. So I love to teach. I love to help. and And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. 